everyone! Uh, welcome to AE103. So here we'll be going into syncing, the bread and butter of emerging assistance. Uh, being able to sync audio and video reliably and delivering it correctly in a way that the editor likes it is what got me through the first several years of assisting um, and got me asked back by editors who just liked the way I had done it. Um, so although Avid definitely does have several ways that you can sync, don't get me wrong, there's auto syncing, there's waveform syncing, um, I'm not going to go into those too much, I'm going to show you my method of how I would go about it when I'm syncing, which isn't necessarily the most common, um, but it's how I will go about it, it's trusted, it's tried and true, it works, it doesn't take that long, and baked into the method it will force you to uh, watch the clips, to take a look, rather than just um, trusting time code or audio to do syncing for you. Um, or having to remember to check is another step. Checking is part of the steps. Um, so I do trust this m way of working. It's, it's the way I've always done it and I'm not about to change anytime soon. The footage that I'll be using to demonstrate this is from a short film that I worked on a couple of years ago called The Treasurer. Um, this was produced by a brilliant production company up in the northeast of Scotland called Page Break Productions. Um, they are lovely guys, I've worked with them again on another project since um, and I'd like to give a big huge thank you to uh, Richard and Mike for letting me use this footage for this purpose. If you'd like to check out their YouTube channel with some of their work, I'll have it linked below as well as the YouTube link to the final cut of this short um, called The Treasure that I cut with them. That'll all be listed down below. So thanks again guys, appreciate it. Over the course of this lesson, I'm going to be syncing all of the footage for the short film again live for you. Don't get me wrong, I'm not going to make you watch all of it. It's like It took me about um, 2 hours and 45 minutes. A bit slower because I'm recording and I'm talking a lot. It wouldn't have taken me quite that long the first time around. As part of the method as to how I've been presenting these videos, I didn't want to gloss over or skim over anything. And rather than just talk about syncing or, or, or showing you a little demonstration, I figured it'd be best to just actually go through an entire project and sync it and show you things that can come up, like how I would handle respeeds, how Avid doesn't like, you know, subclips with more than one piece of audio, doing a dupe test to make sure that you've covered everything, well, little things like that. And yeah, I've been building towards this one for a while, so I really hope that you guys find this useful and this is something that, you know, someone can take into the project and, and use as an assistant. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think that's enough for me. Let's jump into it. Welcome back everyone. Uh, now before we get started, I'm going to recap a couple of things from last time. Um, so last time we showed ingesting external MXFs and putting them into the Avid Media Files folder structure. So I've went ahead and done that for all the shoot days of this particular short film which we're going to be using. Now as demonstrated last time, I've used this date format to ingest each shoot day. So this would be day one, day two, day three, day four. And these are the date that each day was shot. And I've done the same with the audio, just with a slightly different date format. Day one, day two, day three, day four. Um, now for Mac users, um, if you've got lots of projects running at the same time, if you're on your home system, something I also like to do is select them all and do a command option I and add a little tag. Um, to these. So I've added a tag called the treasurer and then I'll tag any other MXF folders of other projects I'm working on with their own tag so I can quickly identify media um, and move it and port it if I have to. As I said before this was demonstrated in the previous video and also was how we got it into Avid by dragging and dropping in this MDB file. So I've done that for all the shoot days here, as you can see, um, and all the sound. I've got them all nice and organized here. And we're going to get to syncing them up. Now, before we get to making sync maps and subclips and all that good stuff, uh, I just want to show you a few commands that I would highly recommend uh, mapping to a key in your keyboard. Um, uh, these are ones that I'll be using frequently throughout the process. And uh, yeah, we'll also take a look at mapping keyboard shortcuts. So if you bring up your settings, uh, in your user settings that is, and then just hit K to go down to keyboard, 
And then just uh, the one that's ticked, our active keyboard. Let's do a little double click on that. And it will bring up a live view of your keyboard. Now, we're also going to need Avid's command palette, uh, which can be found under the tools menu all the way down here. Or you can just hit command three to bring it up that way. Now, once we have these two windows up next to each other, we can start mapping keys. So I'm going to try and be super brief with this, um, you know, overview of mapping keys. But basically, you have all of your keys here and they're separated into different categories. You can drag and drop them straight onto a key on your keyboard. You can also hold shift and then this keyboard will change here and then you can drag and drop and then that will uh, change to any keys while holding the shift modifier. But you're also not just limited by the keys that are available in the command palette. Um, if you hit menu to button reassignment and then hit any button, I'll hit F8 here since I've got it blank anyway, then you can map any function from almost any of the menus within Avid. Um, this includes the menu bars up here as well as the fast menus and even as of recently, uh, bin menus. So we have a lot of options for customization. And if you're having some trouble finding the command that you know must be in here somewhere, there is now a search function. So, so if, for example, I wanted link selection toggle, um, I could just go up here and search link. And then there it's there, link selection toggle. So we do have the search function if you want to find stuff faster that way. Now, linking this back to syncing. The functions that I would say for me and my method of syncing are the, the most essential to have here are um, go to previous event, go to next event. So this used to be um, called fast forward, rewind, and then I think it might have been called go to next edit. But basically that's exactly what it's doing. It's jumping between the edits, um, forwards or backwards. I have them mapped here to my Q and W keys. And once I've built my sync map, these are essential for navigating along that timeline. And we're also going to need the make subclip button. I have it mapped to my N key, um, but this can be found under the edit tab over here. And there's a number of other keys that I could suggest here um, that were that would be great for you to map, like, um, you know, select to the right and left, zooming in and out. Very good one to have. Um, zooming into a region, which is one that I love. But if I was to just make recommendations on all the keys that I think you should have, that would A, be a complete waste of time because everybody works differently, and B, we would be here all day because, you know, I've, I've been building a specific keyboard layout for years. Um, so, and, and, there's a, and there's a lot of really great features and functions and shortcuts to have here. So I just highly recommend having a play around, having a look around and map what's useful to syncing. Now, in the first module, when I went through this uh, layout here, um, project layout, I do believe that I said in this sync folder, I would have bins per shoot day for syncing and it would be sync and subs. And I'm going to start with shoot day two, um, just because it's uh, the most simple, there's a lot more complex stuff in day one, which I will get to, but I'm going to start with shoot day two. So I'm going to do day two sync, day two subs. Right, now that I've got these two bins, what I'm going to need is my sources. I've got my day two picture already open. I'm going to open day two sound. And then what I want to do is make an auto sequence of these files. So an auto sequence is where Avid will read the time code and will build a timeline based off of the time code. So if it's time of day time code um, from the first record to the, you know, cutting the camera on the last take, um, it should be that duration of how long it took that day, essentially, um, because it's using that, that time code to just place everything on a timeline. So you'll see here, I'll go auto sequence on these, and then they're all spaced along here on this timeline. Great. So then I'll just name this day to picture, and I'll do the same thing with the sound. Auto sequence, day to sound, 
Now, once I've done that, I actually don't need my picture and sound bins open anymore, so I'm going to close those. Now, generally speaking, the sound always starts recording first. So I make my sync map by duplicating the sound auto sequence. And then I'll go day to sync. And now we have our sync timeline. Now right now it just has this, the sound on it, but I'm going to put the picture on it and right now. So I'll drag and drop the picture into the source, deselect my uh, audio tracks. Now I did that by just um, holding the shift key and then click and drag. But there is also a command to deselect all audio or deselect all video tracks if you want to map that. And we can see up here that the starting time code for our video um, auto sequence is 20.04.25.17. So we're already at 20.04, so I'm just going to go 25.17, type in here. Now that our time code matches on these two, I should be able to just overwrite edit that and it'll drop straight onto here. And now we have everything, more or less, in sync. So if I zoom in here to our first instance, our first clip. We can see it, we can do a little test play. It looks more or less in sync, but more or less isn't good enough. We want frame accurate syncing. So uh, for me, uh, I want to jump to the slate and I could scroll around and find the slate and then find the clap, but for me, I like to use waveforms. Um, but the more waveforms I have on, especially on my home machine, which is a laptop, um, the more Avid's having to do processing. So I'm only going to want A1's waveforms on. So to do that, I'm going to come down to this menu here and enable Track Control Panel. This may or may not already be there on your machine, but if it isn't, that's how you bring it up. And this is where we can do more controls on a pair track basis, like track-wide audio effects and stuff like that. Um, but for now, I just want to hit that button there to enable the waveforms. So I know the clap's about here, so I'm just going to zoom in there. That's a big spike there. That looks like a clap, and it is. So if I just get close to that, and then with my audio scrubbing on, um, I'm just going to walk frame by frame along. My clap's there. So my clap is actually one frame early. Um, the audio of the clap is one frame early. So with my uh, red segment tool selected and link selection toggle enabled, I'm going to grab my audio and move that one to the right. Now this will be the full stop key or period um, for your North Americans um, to shift to the right. Um, that is already the default keyboard mapping. Now if I shift along, The sound of the clap is now on the first frame of the closed slate, which is always the target and that's what we're after. So we now have one take that is in sync on our timeline. Right, but now it's still on the sequence, we want it as a clip. And before I make that clip, um, I just want to tell you that on these particular audio uh, tracks that were recorded for this film, A1 was always a production mix and the subsequent channels were ISOs of radio mics or boom mics, which is a fairly common approach to doing it. And in that case, I'm only ever going to want on my sub clips, me personally at least, unless your editor tells you otherwise, I'm only ever going to want the mix track um, because that provides me all the best sort of rough audio um, for all the characters mixed by the sound recordist for editing. Um, and we can always match them back and grab the ISOs if needed. So to do that and to make our sub clips, I'm going to do a shift command A to deselect all my tracks, then turn on V1 and then hit T to mark V1 and then I'll re-enable re -enable A1 and that's me got the marked region that I want and then I'll hit my N subclip key and I've subclipped it up and this is scene 3 take 1 and that is our first sync subclip. Let's jump to the next one and hopefully do the next one a little faster. So I'm using that jump to next event, jump to previous event. Take two. 
And then as you do this, you sort of get a sense about where the, the clapper is. Um, you can even learn to recognize just through habit the waveform of the first AD or someone making the initial calls before the clap and you can jump straight to it. It just becomes second nature. So this one is also one frame early. So I'm going to click the audio, got link selection on, nudge one frame forward, do another little sanity check. And yep, I'll accept that. Then I've got my deselect tracks, mark and subclip, three take two. And then I more or less just go along the whole timeline like this. Um, after doing this just a small handful of times, you can get pretty fast at it. Um, I also have some scripts written for this. So for example, once I've nudged it over, I have a script that will subclip it out. So it's going to select just the tracks I need and subclip out just because, well, why not? Now, generally speaking, I would be naming these subclips by the slate, um, but the, there was some slating issues on this production, as I recall. Um, and so then I just went by the scene and I switched to the American slating system, um, which just makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, the British one, I'm still getting used to. Um, in New Zealand, we use the American one as well. It's been a bit of an adjustment. Now, I'm now on my fourth clip and I've noticed that so far all of them have just been one frame too early. And if this is something that's coming up and you're noticing that they're all out by the same amount, you can account for that. So you could make an adjustment for the rest of the timeline. So I'll do that by because uh, there's nothing on this bottom track here, I'm just going to add an edit across all tracks. If this current clip went all the way to the bottom, you wouldn't have to. But that's just to make sure that when I do this next part, which is select right, select right can be mapped from the command palette and will allow you to select everything to the right or to the left of the playhead, a uh, very useful function. And now that I've got everything selected right, I'll move them all forward one frame. So now, in theory, if everything was one frame out, they'll now all be in sync. But we'll go through and we'll see as we go along. Right, now here we have a an NG, a no good shot. Um, it was just the clapper board, nothing happened, they cut before they rolled. So in this instance, I will just, just sub out the picture and I'll just call that no good. But I'll always make sure to subclip out everything picture-wise and you'll see why at the end that everything gets subclipped. And it looks like our site-wide adjustment that we made just before has worked because this one's perfectly in sync. And it's also a good idea as well after you do your clap um, to just jump to the middle of the clip and just play a few, a few seconds. Can I explain just... And just make sure everything seems hunky-dory. Uh, this is particularly necessary if uh, you're working on a multi-camera shoot um, and so there'll be an A clap and a B clap and you may have potentially moved the sync of the clap for the wrong camera and so then if you jump and you do a quick test play that will become obvious to you. Now I've came across one right at the very end of the day that needed the audio slipped back. So before our site-wide adjustment, it was actually in sync. Um, but that's why we do our check and we check the slate on every clip. Take one. Right, now, if you ever come across any solo um, sound files that don't have any picture matching up to them, um, you should have a listen and check what they are. Now, this one's kind of mislabeled. Uh, generally speaking, um, if it's labeled as prepared the slate like the other ones are, then you should have picture above it, and then you start checking for a missing picture file. In this case, it's actually a well track, and it just hasn't been labeled as such. But if you do a quick test listen, particularly at the start, they'll generally call what it is. And if it's a well track, again, I will just sub out 
the mix, I'll just call it wild scene 3 atmos. And now we have all of our sync subclips for shoot day 3. So the only thing that I would do here, now that we have everything up, you'll see that the icon for all of these shows that these are sequences. When you subclip anything out from a sequence, it'll generally be another sequence. But to turn these into clips, I'm just going to select them all, right click, and hit auto sync. And now all of these are synced subclips ready to go to the editor. And at this point, I will do some color coding. So anything that is an NG can just go red. And the wild, um, I will generally put as a dark green. And for this scene, it is predominantly from this character. I assign scenes based on a character. I've went into this in another video showing you all the different ways you can use color coding in Avid. But quite often different editors will have their own methods and how they want things colored. And so when you come on to a production at the start as an assistant, it's one of the first thing you'll ask is how they like their rushes prepared. And if they do want their clips colored, then you would do it here before you start putting them into scene bins and everything, once you've got them synced and prepped and checked. But if hypothetically you were assisting for me, then you would be color coding per character and I'm going to assign him blue. So all of his scenes will be blue. Right now, before I finish this shoot day, there's one thing left to do. Um, and I call this a dupe test. So I'll create another sequence over here and just call it dupe test. And then I'll just throw all of my sub clips onto it. All right. Then I will open up the source picture bin again. And with my playhead at the very end here, just zoom in so I can see the space afterwards, I will throw all of these on as well. Now, once I have all of these on, I'll do the dupe test. So I come over here and Avid has this feature called dupe detection, which will detect duplicates on the timeline and mark them. So I'm going to turn it on for a video. And then I go over to the source and you see this little colored line here. So that will march, it will match where the duplicate is um, earlier in the timeline. I will skim across all of these files and make sure that all of them has a line and all of the file has a line. And if you go along and all of these have the colored line on them, that means that you've accounted for all of the picture files that you have there in the Avid that, that was passed to you. Um, so it's just a good sanity check, you know, if something gets missed from the auto sequence or it got clipped because of a time, time code conflict or, or anything, uh, this will catch it. And then you can, oh yeah, that one hasn't been done. And then you just go do that one. So that is always on my list of tasks that I tick off as I'm going. And that is one day synced. Right, now, as I said, I started with day two because it was a bit simpler. Um, it's some nice straightforward syncing. Now, uh, day one is a bit more irregularities, um, but they aren't that irregular. They do come up quite frequently. Um, so let's take a look at those. So for starters, when I've tried to make my sync um, timeline, you can see I made my sound part no problem, but when you look at the duration of the picture, it says 22 hours. Um, and this is because, if I open it up and show you, the time code for certain parts are, you know, wildly a uh, different part of the day. Now, this is a common issue when uh, they're doing night shoots and they shoot from, um, you know, so say in this case, uh, roughly uh, seven o'clock through to about 1 a.m. roughly. Uh, but when they go across that midnight line and keep shooting and making new clips, um, Avid's building it based on time code. Um, so it starts at zero and then includes all this empty space. So all of these, for me, I would subclip out as a separate part. So I would say day one picture, say part two. And then I would grab these ones and go and go day one picture part one. Right now, and we can see part one here is about three hours 40. 
which pretty much aligns with our sound. So there's a good chance that this section fully completes that and that this doesn't have sync audio. It could be that they don't need sync audio, maybe it's just B-roll or establishers, or it could be that it's high frame rate material where they're not bothering to make sync audio to it. We don't know yet, we'll see as we go. So obviously I'm going to start with um, my sound. So I'm going to put part one in there, deselect my audio tracks, 1905064, and then I'm going to throw that on there. So some of this matches audio, we can see from the top, and we've got some that sits on the wrong. And see, whenever you see that, when they're right bunched up together um, and potentially even overlapping each other, you know that that's probably high frame rate material um, because the time code's overlapping and the auto sequence doesn't always handle it right. So for that, generally speaking, they just get sat next to each other in the audio sequence, in the auto sequence. But I have, granted a long time ago, uh, seen it where they overwrite each other. So I just always do a little wiggle at each of the edits and just make sure that there's no extra material that isn't being represented on the timeline. But these are fine. So, come down here. So we've got a close-up of the radio in the car as he's driving. He turns it on. Now the slate on this doesn't have a clap, um, but that's probably because there's no dialogue um, and it's not massively essential that it's frame accurate sync. So in this case, what I would do is I would still subclip it the same way. And then I always have this column here as I'm syncing um, and making subclips called AE notes. And then I would just note in anything like that. So I would just put like no visual sync ref. I'm typing these out, but I normally have scripts still just put that in. So that then the editor knows that it, it may not be potentially frame accurate because there might be something that we've missed here as we're going along like a stone bounces off the windshield or something like that and it's not exactly frame accurate that we miss when we're doing our checks just so that that note is there that it's not frame accurate and since we have a take two of this here as well and it looks like this has been done well they've been driving so they haven't slated again so that'll be for take two. And we'll give that the same note. So it looks to me there's something interesting that's going on with the file naming here. Um, either they've stopped off and recorded some high frame rate material of them running, then went straight back to the car and then done more of them running later. Or this is just wrong. Um, but I'm actually going to mark this and do it later with the rest. Right, so this one doesn't have any sound, but it's not a high frame rate. It is normal frame rate material. It's just there wasn't any point in putting sound in there because they've mounted the camera to the car. And in this case, we've got three normal frame rate shots. So if they don't have any slates, I would just recognize the action and try and check the script for where they happen. Basically, you're just looking for a scene. Um, you can normally get the scene information from the sound or from the slate, but if you're not getting it from anywhere else, you can fall back to the script. Or more likely, also the call sheet will say, you know, so you check the call sheet from the day before, it should have a list of what they were shot with descriptions. So in this case, Jerry driving along a road and it would list the scene number. There's always ways to find the inform information you need fairly quickly. Bravo take one and moss, which is how we always know that there's no sound. Don't ask me what it stands for because I don't know for sure. I've heard I've heard both motor only sound and mute on sound as as perfectly plausible explanations. Uh, basically it just means there's no sound on the clip. Cool, so we've got our three moss clips there. Carrying up. So here, just something small to note, we can see that sound has started rolling, then picture, then sounds cut, and then restarted again quickly. 
So when I subclip this out, we can't have multiple sound files on the subclip or it won't let us turn it into a clip. So I'm just going to move that out the way. Now uh, we've got rid of that problem, but if I was to go here and subclip that out and do the auto sync, it's going to trim off this part without the sound. So before I do that, just to make sure my jute test that we can see that everything's accounted for, I'm going to subclip this part out and just call it an NG. And that's because this is before action roll, so it's definitely an NG. It's not useful to us. You know, if there was something particularly funny there, you could sub out for the bloopers, but basically we don't need that. But I still want it to appear in the dupe test so that I know that that portion of the clip's been accounted for. So I'll subclip that out as an NG. Now, it can be tricky sometimes if you've got these ghost frames, but generally speaking, I want to see at least uh, one solid part of the, the top part of the clapper touching the bottom part before I'm putting a sound there. Sometimes with these, it can be tricky to jump straight to the waveform of the clap because the action clearly in this scene is a lot of spiked audio. Yeah, he's digging. There's lots of sharp hits. So if you but if you still want to try and use the waveform to find it, a good hint is that thicker part just before with all the talking and the calls before the clap. Right now, here's a good example is another thing that you can do if they've forgotten to slate. So as long as you know what the slate's supposed to be, which you can generally find from your continuity notes and your camera sheets and stuff like that, um, you can look for some sort of tapping that's diegetic to the scene. So here we have this um, handle hitting the lamp. And the tap comes one frame too early. I can shut that over. That's better. Now you can use um, doors shutting and um, people putting mugs down and, and lots of things like that. Sometimes if I'm really, really desperate and there's nothing else to go on and they haven't s s clapped, um, I'll use uh, consonants when people are talking, like uh, P's and B's, and you zoom right in on their mouth and you see exactly the frame where the air escapes and the sound should just be beginning. Um, but that one can get a bit muddy. But in those cases, um, I'll put a note in my EE notes as well. Um, still saying like no clap. Not the same as no visual sync because we did have visual sync there and we're pretty sure that it's in sync, but just let them know that there was no clapper board. Right, so that's our standard frame rate material synced for day one. Hey guys, thank you very much for watching. Now the keen among you will have noticed that this video is once again split into two parts. That just had to be done. I synced an entire short film, so it took some time. But part two will be coming at you on next Thursday with a whole load more of information to do with uh, syncing your material. So I'll see you next week for part two.